This is Jay Sekulow. The fiasco in Fulton County continues as the judge rules on the Fannie Willis disqualification case. Keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever. This is Sekulow. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jay Sekulow. Everybody, welcome to the broadcast. The much-awaited decision from Judge McAfee in the Fulton County fiasco case um, has come out. And I, I will tell you something. There's a lot of commentary on this particular order and opinion. I will tell you I think it is um, wrong, and I'm going to give you just one example. The judge basically said either Fawny Willis goes or Wade goes, the chief deputy. And if Wade goes, she can stay in the case. But he wrote this, and and this is... I, I can't reconcile his decision when he writes words like this. An odor of mendacity remains in this case. That means an, an odor of lying remains in this case. And if you want the impartial submission of justice, especially I think when you're dealing with an ex-president, but with anybody, and the efficient and, and lawful and due process of equal protection process of a criminal justice system, the thing to do here was not to be, quote, the wisdom of Solomon, and cut the baby in half, and in this case, neither half wins, but rather to make a concluding fact is, hey, there's an odor of mendacity, the judge's words, in this case, and therefore, one of them has to go, but not both. That makes absolutely no sense, zero. Andy? That's absolutely correct, Jay. This is a disappointing opinion, very disappointing opinion, because the judge, first of all, says, quotes Georgia law, and then finds that there's an appearance of impropriety uh, that applies to criminal prosecutions that could disqualify a prosecutor. And yet he says the court found an appearance of impropriety to exist in this case. The perceived conflict in the reasonable eyes of the public threatens confidence in the legal system. I'm reading from the judge's opinion. When this danger goes uncorrected, it undermines the legitimacy and moral force of our already weakest branch of government. Well, having found that, why in the world did you give Fawny Willis the opportunity to stay on in the case? Why didn't you just say her office and her are disqualified from the case? Another prosecutor has to come in. Instead, you say that with the appearance of impropriety, the odor of mendacity, lying, as Jay mentioned, nonetheless, I'm not going to do anything. I'll tell you why. It's very simply this. It is a Republican judge running for re-election in a Democratic county. There's no other way around it, Jay. No, because the judge specifically found that there were... what they call the appearance of impropriety, which is the standard upon which you say the case can't move forward. Lawyers can't operate that way. Um, there is a possibility of appeals. We'll get into that. Not likely, in my view, that that's going to be successful, to be quite honest. Uh, there is a New Georgia Senate investigation going on. The governor's looking at it. So th- there's more to unfold here. But this was, uh, I-, I think, a very weak decision, in my view, uh, on how this matter goes. And, and this just goes to show you the nature of, of this. But, you know, the ACLJ were involved in all of these different kind of fights. As we've been mentioning for the last two weeks, we are now in the middle of our life and liberty drive here at the ACLJ. And as we continue to witness the left's weaponization of the justice system to attack their political rivals, the ACLJ continues to fight back. But we can only do that through your support and your help. Right now, we are preparing to defend the Constitution by filing a brief at the Supreme Court in the Trump immunity case. That is due Tuesday. We're fighting the two-tiered system of justice to defend the FBI whistleblowers. Our next brief on that one is due April 3rd. We're battling with now 19 cases against the Biden deep state, and that's because we're filing today a federal cause of action against the State Department over the issue of funds from the State Department being given to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Agency, with the knowledge that UNRWA was aiding and abetting Hamas. Please support these battles with us now during our Life and Liberty Drive. Any amount you donate is doubled at ACLJ.org. And if you're able, please become an ACLJ champion. We started this campaign for champions with about 15000 Our goal is to get to almost 30000 in the next 12 to 18 months. First goal coming up is 20000 and I'm happy to say we are only 162 short of our goal. If you can be one of those 162 champions, we would really appreciate it. Those are champions who fight alongside us each and every month. If you can make a one-time gift only, that's absolutely fine, too. Go to ACLJ.org to have your gifts doubled now. A 
major ruling in Georgia's election interference case against Donald Trump and 14 other co-defendants. Judge Scott McAfee has just ruled Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis can remain on the case. His name is Scott McAfee. He did decide uh, today and he gave himself that two-week deadline, as I mentioned. And the decision that he has had to make is whether to disqualify the Fulton County DA, Fonnie Willis, in response to allegations that she was dating her lead prosecutor when she hired him. And the accusation is that that was part of a motivation for hiring him. Is it enough that this just looks bad, that there's an appearance of a conflict? Or did they need to prove, did the defendants, that Trump and his co-defendants, need to prove that there was an actual conflict? Now, again, I say that DA Fonnie Willis can stay on this case. It also appears that the judge is saying that this appearance issue needs to be addressed before this can go forward. The judge in this case this morning saying the defendants did actually not prove an alleged or did not prove an actual conflict of interest from all that financial entanglement. However, the judge is saying there is an appearance of conflict. The decision says the district attorney may choose to step aside along with the entirety of her office or she can let Nathan Wade go and the case can continue. So with the ball is now in Fonnie Willis's court to decide how to proceed. Donald Trump's team and his co-defendants say this is all a disqualifying conflict of interest. Uh, the case should be thrown out because of it. The DA stays on the case, hence her office stays on the case, hence it can continue to move forward. I'm somebody who wants to push common sense, not Washington, D.C. spin and, and newsroom spins, but we outside of D.C. watch and we can have a barometer for when someone is not giving us common sense. And it's just common sense that she should not be on the case and she should be disbarred. Here's what the judge said, this Judge McAfee in the Fulton County fiasco. He said the two options the court gives are, are the following. That's the quote. The district attorney may choose to step aside along with the whole of her office and refer the prosecution to the prosecuting attorney's counsel for reassignment. That's a Georgia provision that allows a, an organization to then sign into another uh, district attorney. Alternatively, the SADA, that's Wade, can withdraw, allowing the DA, the defendants, and the public to move forward without his presence or remuneration distracting from and potentially compromising the merits of this case, which is interesting, Judge McAfee, because you also say that an odor of mendacity, mendacity remains in the case even if they're both, one of them's gone. So either it, it does or it doesn't. And, and that's the problem with the court's order. This wasn't the wisdom of Solomon. This is a sloppy order by a judge in a superior court in Fulton County who I think is under tremendous political pressure. But I think it's a, a, a ridiculous decision. Harry, you've, Harry Hutchinson's has joined us. You've taken a look at it. Uh, what's your sense? Well, my sense is that Judge McAfee failed to answer, at least properly, the questions posed by this particular case brought by the defendants. So among the questions that Judge McAfee asked and answered, and questions that were indeed posed by the defendants, was whether there was an actual conflict of interest as opposed to the appearance of a conflict of interest. He asked that question and focused on that question, even though the appearance of a conflict is sufficient under Georgia law to disqualify the, D the DA. Second, Judge McAfee asked, did the defendants meet their burden of proving an actual conflict of interest in this case, even though that is not a necessary question? Judge McAfee says no, uh, despite unmistakable evidence showing a financial entanglement between the two principals, that is, Mr. Wade and Fonnie Willis. Third, the judge asked, was there evidence of forensic misconduct? That is, did Fonnie Willis issue prejudicial statements? The evidence, I think, is clear on that question. Yes, she did issue Prejudicial statements compounded, of course, by evidence of mendacity. Fourth, does the established record highlight a significant appearance of impropriety that infects the current structure of the prosecution team? The judge says, yes, there's sufficient evidence. However, 
we will not disqualify. Instead, we will give the option to the DA. My own view is Judge McAfee issued a very weak opinion, one that does not rely on either the law or precedent in Georgia, and I think the American people should be disappointed. We're getting a lot of questions about, will this case go to trial before November? Andy, I don't think so. No. Uh, there's no way. No. This case will not go to trial before November. Just to mention, this is an interlocutory ruling. That is to say, it is a ruling during the pendency of a case. It is not immediately appealable as a matter of right. However, the judge could let either side, since both sides lost and both sides won, in a sense, take the case to the Georgia Court of Appeals, which the Georgia Court of Appeals could grant the interlocutory review or not. The chances are the Georgia Court of Appeals will not. But it is now March 15th. The likelihood of this case being tried before the election in November is zero, in my opinion. Uh, let's go to Martin in North Carolina. He's on line one. We're taking your calls at 800-684-3110. I know it's confusing, so any questions you have, don't be afraid to ask. Martin, go ahead. You're on the air. Thank you, Mr. Stekla. I appreciate it. And I don't disagree uh, uh, with your statement that you made at the beginning, but is there the possibility that they're looking for charges or indictments against Willis and Wade or the others that may have not been fully, well, not telling the truth during their testimonies during this trial or proceeding? I don't think so at all, because the judge doesn't give a lot of credit to the testimony. He says, while the testimony wasn't particularly helpful, he doesn't say that they knowingly made a false statement. And that would be uh, a predicate to uh, an under oath statement that you knowingly made false. So, Andy, I, I don't see that. No, I don't see that either. Besides, the judge doesn't charge the uh, prosecutor charges right. with perjury. And Fonnie Willis is not going to charge herself. This would require the governor to put in a special a uh, district attorney to determine whether perjury has con been committed, unlikely. Yeah, I, I, I just I don't see it. Um, l let me see this. Um, Ellie Honing, CNN. There, it's interesting to get start seeing the commentary coming in on this. Take a listen. One of you has to go. Either the DA and with her the entire office or Nathan Wade. This will be the easiest decision the yeah. DA's office has ever had to make. Obviously, Nathan Wade will go. And the judge in his ruling says, essentially, this is necessary to preserve public confidence in this case. He says there's enough of an appearance. There's an, enough of, uh, as he says at one point, an odor of mendacity oh. around this case. Interesting phrase. Hmm. That something's got to be done to at least clean up the but public perception. Smells. Uh, further to Andy's point uh, that we were just making before about, you know, was there going to be, could you be charged with perjury? The judge says there are other forms or sources of authority, such as the General Assembly, the Georgia State Ethics Commission, the State Bar of Georgia, the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, or the voters of Colton County may offer feedback and any unanswered questions that linger. The question that lingers is there's a taint over this proceeding, Harry, and I don't know how you remove the taint. Well, I think you're absolutely correct because one of the questions that the judge focused on was whether there is a conflict of interest. Uh, what is a conflict of interest? It includes acquiring a personal interest or financial stake in the defendant's conviction. And there is indeed evidence in the record showing that Fonnie Willis had a personal stake in the defendant's conviction. Uh, and that is compounded by evidence of mendacity. So the appropriate remedy under the circumstances is to disqualify Bonnie Willis. I think the judge lacked sufficient courage to disqualify her. And I think uh, whatever the outcome of the uh, case against Donald Trump and the defendants m may be, whatever that outcome, uh, I think many uh, individuals will lose confidence in the judgment of G Georgia law and the prosecutor's office. Here's what's so interesting. The court concludes that there was sufficient evidence of an, a, quote, an appearance of impropriety. The court explained that why the appearance of impropriety standard did apply to the criminal prosecution. Now, listen to what he said, Andy. The appearance standard recognizes that even when no actual conflict exists, a perceived conflict in the reasonable eyes of the public, threatens confidence in the legal system itself. When this danger goes uncorrected, it undermines the legitimacy and moral force of our already weakest branch of government. If that is the case, why did you not disqualify the DA's office? That's exactly right. If that is the case, Judge, you said that. Why did you not find that the district attorney's office, Fonnie Willis, and all her assistants in the office are disqualified? 
You say the district attorney's prosecution is encumbered by an appearance of impropriety. You say that this affects the public perception of the criminal justice system. You say that there is an order of lying in the case. Why in the world have you allowed the district attorney now to make the decision whether she stays in the case or her boyfriend leaves? Why have you done that? Why don't you take the courage and say, with all these things combined, you cannot stay in this case and give the public a sense of integrity in the criminal justice system. That's all I want, integrity in the criminal justice system, because you can't pull the trigger. Very sad. If, they would have granted, if the judge would have granted the order, it would not have meant that uh, Fawny Willis' case will not eventually be prosecuted. This wasn't a motion to dismiss. It would have just been prosecuted by a different office. Now, it's true that a new DA could come in there and say this whole case is ridiculous, which I think it is. But this was not the motion to dismiss on the merits to remove the case permanently. This was, was this appearance of impropriety of significant, which it clearly is. If a judge is saying an odor of mendacity surrounds the case, my goodness, Judge McAfee, what were you thinking? You know, you're a conservative judge, supposedly, and, you know, think about that as you make this decision. But, folks, this is why we continue to fight these cases. As we've been mentioning for the last two weeks, we are now in the middle of our life and liberty drive here at the ACLJ. And as we continue to witness the left's weaponization of the justice system to attack their political rivals, the ACLJ continues to fight back. But we can only do that through your support and your help. Right now, we are preparing to defend the Constitution by filing a brief at the Supreme Court in the Trump immunity case. That is due Tuesday. We're fighting the two-tiered system of justice to defend the FBI whistleblowers. Our next brief on that one is due April 3rd. We're battling with now 19 cases against the Biden deep state, and that's because we're filing today a federal cause of action against the State Department over the issue of funds from the State Department being given to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Agency, with the knowledge that UNRWA was aiding and abetting Hamas. Please support these battles with us now during our Life and Liberty Drive. Any amount you donate is doubled at ACLJ.org. And if you're able, please become an ACLJ champion. We started this campaign for champions with about 15,000. Our goal is to get to almost 30,000 in the next 12 to 18 months. First goal coming up is 20,000. And I'm happy to say we are only 162 short of our goal. If you can be one of those 162 champions, we would really appreciate it. Those are champions who fight alongside us each and every month. If you can make a one-time gift only, that's absolutely fine, too. Go to ACLJ.org to have your gifts doubled now. Given how all of this played out, given all of the evidence that came out during the days-long hearing there in Georgia, the judge is saying the DA essentially has two options now, as you laid out, Kristen. She can either remove herself and her entire office from the case completely, which would be a severe blow, or she can remove Nathan Wade from the case. He does have some considerable criticism for her. He's saying, look, without sufficient evidence that the district attorney acquired a personal stake in this prosecution or that her financial arrangements had any impact on the case, he also also finds that there's significant appearance of impropriety that infects mm. the entire current structure of the prosecution team. This was a self-inflicted wound that should have been healed and taken care of months ago, but basically they just let it get infected. Look, disqualification isn't necessary here where there is a less drastic and sufficiently remedial solution available, and that's when he gives Fonnie Willis the choice. Where does Fonnie Willis go from here in making this decision? I think Nathan Wade, you know, uh, resigns. I think he uh, files some sort of document that says it in the best interest of the case. He's not moving forward with the case. He's going to he's gonna step down. Now, Fonnie Willis is somebody who's is a little bit of a maverick. She's somebody who you know, kind of forges her own path. So there is a slight possibility that she decides to challenge this ruling. But if she's smart, and she is very smart, she'll let Nathan Wade step aside. Fonnie Willis has been ordered to either step aside or she has to cut, prosecu cut ties with her special prosecutor in the case, Nathan Wade, before uh, the case can go to trial. The quote that is really sticking in my mind right now mm -hmm. is when he talks about the testimony of Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis, he basically says that they did not put concerns that were raised by the defendants to rest, that while the defendants did not prove that there was an actual conflict of interest and meet their burden of proof, and odor of mendacity remains.
break, I was taking some notes. So the way it's going to work out, I think, is clearly what Pawnee Willis is going to do. Is she's going to get rid of Wade and say, you're, you know, you're done. This way she stays in. But here's the question, Andy. If Nathan Wade is removed, the work that he generated, the work product that he generated during this period of time would be under the one song case, normally deemed fruit of the poisonous tree. That's right. There's nothing in the order about that at all. No, he doesn't think it out. The judge doesn't think so it out. So what happens then to all the info? He was the lead prosecutor. What happens to all the tell you what witness I interviews and evidence they gathered? I'll tell you what I would do if I were the defense attorney. It's called a motion to suppress. I would say that everything that was gained by this person who was improperly in the case should be suppressed, and everything that comes from that fruit of the poisonous tree should also be suppressed, and all the evidence that was accumulated by the acts of uh, and practices and transactions of Nathan Wade should be suppressed and not be permitted to be used as evidence in the case. Yeah, well, one of our one of our listeners on Rumble said, what good does it do to get rid of Wade but not his work? None. This is a prophylactic, uh, it's like putting a Band-Aid on a, on, a, a, on a gashing wound. I mean, that's the problem with this. The taint here, Harry, is real, and it... And the judge acknowledges it when he talks about the manda- the odor of mendacity remains in this case. Absolutely. And so the judge has exhibited extreme weakness. And uh, Andy is absolutely correct. Judge McAfee simply allows evidence infected by the appearance of impropriety to remain in the case. And so that evidence should now be removed and a motion to suppress such evidence uh, should be allowed, and that would require a Fonnie Willis, to, if she remains as the DA in this particular case, she must restart her investigation, and she should not be allowed to rely on tainted evidence. I, I, there's another quote in this opinion. I'm going to get to your phone calls in one moment here that is worth reading. An outsider could reasonably think that the district attorney is not exercising her independent professional judgment, totally free of any compromising influences. I mean, I, you, you write that, and then you get the wrong conclusion. That's what's so absurd. Jonathan's calling from North Carolina on line two. Jonathan, go ahead. You're on the air. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, you you guys are kind of hitting on my question. Uh, if she chooses to remove Wade, how will her office be able to continue prosecuting the case? Will she have to get a new prosecutor to come in, okay. or will she be able to continue no, the the office would not be removed. That's what the judge is saying. If 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 Fawny Willis makes the election to take herself out of the case, the whole office is out. There's no way she's going to do that. So she fires Wade. Then her office can continue. Does she hire a new special counsel? Maybe Andy. I mean, she has the right to. She's got 150 lawyers in the office. She can use the big office. The Fulton DA's office is the biggest office in the state. Or she can go outside and hire a special assistant DA, like she did with Nathan Wade from the private bar in Georgia, former prosecutor, former defense attorney. She she's not you know hampered by not having Wade. Well, she may be in other ways, but she wouldn't be hampered in prosecuting her criminal case without him. The one thing I will say though that makes no sense to me, Harry, is I I, I you know with due respect to the judge. You cannot write the odor of mendacity stays and the appearance sufficient evidence of appearance of impropriety and not remove the district attorney who's ultimately responsible for the odor and the appearance of impropriety. I think you're absolutely correct. And one of the things that the judge has done with his opinion is he has impeached himself, raising the question whether or not he is competent to remain on the bench. This is basically, uh, inarguably, uh, an incoherent opinion. It, it really is. I'm going to go ahead and grab another phone call. Christine's calling from New Jersey on line three. If you want to talk to us, 800-684-3110. Christine? Yes. Hi, I have a quick question. I, I personally think that the judge is compromised in the whole situation. I don't know why he didn't excuse himself. I'm under the impression and was told that he had a fundraiser for Fonnie Willis. Just curious if this is true. Yeah, I think he did. I think he uh, supported her financially. They don't remember judges in Fulton in Georgia do not run on a party basis. So what he did was not illegal or unauthorized. Um, he worked in that office with Fonnie Willis at some point early in his career. Uh, he's only 34 years old. I think the judge just got it wrong, really wrong. Whether that goes to the level of recusal, probably not. But uh, 
the judge himself, this decision is ridiculous. It's a juvenile decision to be. I mean, this is. I, I'm going to say it. Can I say what I said before? Yeah. I'm going to say what I said. This is absurd. You're charging the former president of the United States and other very well-known lawyers in Georgia with some crazy RICO theory. You engaged in what the court has now found sufficient evidence of the appearance of impropriety. The judge goes on to say there's an odor of mendacity or surrounding this case, and you don't hold the district attorney who's responsible for both the appearance of impropriety and the odor from the case? And you give her the option of how she'd like to resolve it? Fire your assistant or fire yourself. What do you think she's going to do? So, you know, go ahead and fire your assistant or just fire yourself. But the reality is, we know what's going to happen, is Wade's out. But is the evidence that he collected out? I doubt it. Is Are we in a situation where now we're seeing, we will, or we will see, this unfolding of taint of this entire process and makes the country more concerned about these unbelievable Andy irregularities? Well, you know, Jay, it, it, it's dis, it's disquieting and disappointing to see a judge take the position where you think as you read the opinion, he's getting it right, he's getting it right. There's an odor of mendacity. There is an appearance of impropriety. The criminal justice system is at stake. The integrity of the entire process is in the balance. Uh, they did the wrong thing in every time, uh, splitting the money and so forth. And you're waiting to see the end result, and yet the judge fails you in the end because of a lack of courage on his part and because he's looking at the political realities of Fulton County. And I'm going to say it. It's very sad that that is the case. I think it's a bad day for the justice system. It's a bad day for Fulton County. It makes these it makes these counties look like they're in operating in third world countries. That's the problem with all of this. The taint on all of this, the impropriety, the appearance of impropriety, the mendacity, of, odor of mendacity hanging over the proceedings, but... Don't worry, we're going to let the DA who created all this mess make a decision on how she'd like to proceed. You lost, but you get to make the decision. That's what's so absurd here. But again, this is the reason why we fight on so many issues. As we've been mentioning for the last two weeks, we are now in the middle of our life and liberty drive here at the ACLJ. And as we continue to witness the left's weaponization of the justice system to attack their political rivals, the ACLJ continues to fight back. But we can only do that through your support and your help. Right now, we are preparing to defend the Constitution by filing a brief at the Supreme Court in the Trump immunity case. That is due Tuesday. We're fighting the two-tiered system of justice to defend the FBI whistleblowers. Our next brief on that one is due April 3rd. We're battling with now 19 cases against the Biden deep state, and that's because we're filing today a federal cause of action against the State Department over the issue of funds from the State Department being given to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Agency, with the knowledge that UNRWA was aiding and abetting Hamas. Please support these battles with us now during our Life and Liberty Drive. Any amount you donate is doubled at ACLJ.org. And if you're able, please become an ACLJ champion. We started this campaign for champions with about 15,000. Our goal is to get to almost 30,000 in the next 12 to 18 months. First goal coming up is 20,000, and I'm happy to say we are only 162 short of our goal. If you can be one of those 162 champions, we would really appreciate it. Those are champions who fight alongside us each and every month. If you can make a one-time gift only, that's absolutely fine, too. Go to aclj.org to have your gifts doubled now. The ACLJ fights the battles that matter most to our members. We listen to you, and we're taking action through the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. Every dime we receive goes to defend life and liberty, from Capitol Hill to Geneva to the United Nations. Now is the time to fight. The rights to life and liberty are the cornerstones of our constitutional republic, but they are under attack. That is why we're proud to announce the return of the ACLJ Life and Liberty Drive. This month, we're redoubling our efforts to beat back the radical left's attacks on your constitutional freedoms and to defend the sanctity of human life, not just here at home, but around the world. Every gift you give will be doubled dollar for dollar, doubling your impact for life and liberty. Go to aclj.org right now and help us.
keeping you informed and engaged. Now more than ever, this is Seculo. And now your host, Jay Seculo. Hey, welcome back to the broadcast, everyone. If you're watching on any of our social media apps, uh, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, Twitter, we encourage you to share the feed with your friend and make sure you're subscribing. We've got a lot of new people that are watching here. We've got calls coming in. So McAfee said basically, hey, Fannie Willis, district attorney, you make the dis- we think your case has the appearance of impropriety. We think there's an odor of mendacity, which is lying, surrounding the case. But you get to make the decision of whether you go or Wade goes. If Wade goes, your office can stay in. If you go, the whole office goes out. So you, guess what? Wake up, America. What's going to happen there? She's going to say Wade goes. Then she'll just appoint some other friend of hers. Um, so this has raised a whole host of questions, and we are getting a lot of questions coming in at one 800 684 Tell me go right to the phones. Terry is calling from Missouri Online 4. Terry, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. My, my question is, uh, did the judge not potentially just taint the jury by allowing her to remain on the case but saying there's impropriety? So it's interesting you said that. The judge obviously thought about that issue because that's a really good question you raised. And he wrote this, the case is too far removed from the jury selection to establish a permanent taint of the jury pool as best it can divine under the sole direction of Williams. That's a case. The court cannot find that this speech crossed the line to the point where the defendants have denied the opportunity of a fundamentally fair trial or that requires the district attorney's disqualification. Meanwhile, Harry, he said, there's an odor of untruthfulness around the case and the appearance of impropriety. At the same time, that there's no basis to throw them her out. Absolutely. So uh, it's important also to remember that for a conflict of interest to exist, um, it means that there is evidence that one of the parties acquired a personal interest or a personal stake in the defendant's conviction. And there is indeed evidence on the record showing that Fonnie Willis had a personal stake in the defendant's conviction. And then this is compounded by evidence of mendacity. So irrespective of whether or not the jury pool has been tainted by her speech, I think it is clear that there is a an appearance of impropriety, and the judge failed to do the right thing. And the judge says in the opinion that, you know, the, the speech she gave doesn't taint the jury pool, but it was still legally improper, providing this type of public comment creates dangerous waters for the district attorney to wade further into. I, I don't get it, Andy, what this judge is doing. Well, I don't either. I mean, you know, he goes, he starts out like he's going to do the right thing, and then he turns around and does what I think is the wrong thing. But, I mean, uh, I don't, I, I can't read the tea leaves too much, but I'm concerned about the outcome of the case. And I think when you talk about the jury pool, you don't know that until you actually select the jury and during voir dire and examination of the individual jurors as to whether or not anything that may have happened has tainted their opinion of the guilt or innocence of the accused. So that is down the road. But this is a, this is a, a, a case that, you know, is, is, uh, it stinks. He says it stinks. Yeah. But he's not doing anything about the stink. I'm going to tell you this is what we're going to do. We have a lot of callers coming in. So we were going to hit a couple other topics, but we are going to do uh, take your phone calls. But let me encourage you to do this, folks. Um, at the American Center for Law, we're in our halfway point, uh, exactly today, actually, of our life and liberty challenge. And, and you know the cases that we're involved in. Whether that is making sure your right to vote was protected in the 14th Amendment case. By the way, we're expecting a second order in that case, although we won already. 9-0 to zero at the Supreme Court. Have we checked the orders list, Will? We have nothing yet. That'll probably come out this afternoon or Monday uh, on our separate appeal there. Um, the less weaponization of the justice system is what we've been talking about for the last hour. We're preparing to defend the Constitution. We're filing an amicus brief on the immunity issue next week on Tuesday. We file fighting the two-tiered system of justice with those whistleblowers. That's on April 3rd. We now have 19 cases against the Biden deep state. And we're filing a federal lawsuit today against the State Department. Oh, excuse me, over the issue of funds from the State Department being given um, money to UNRWA with the knowledge that UNRWA was aiding and abetting Hamas. So you're supporting these battles. Your gift will be doubled at ACLJ.org. And if you can become an ACLJ champion, which is someone that stands with us each and every month, it makes a huge difference. Started our campaign in October with 15000 We are just 162 short of 20,000 champions. Go to ACLJ.org. Back with more in a moment.
major ruling in Georgia's election interference case against Donald Trump and 14 other co-defendants. Judge Scott McAfee has just ruled Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis can remain on the case. His name is Scott McAfee. He did decide uh, today and he gave himself that two-week deadline, as I mentioned. And the decision that he has had to make is whether to disqualify the Fulton County DA, Fonnie Willis, in response to allegations that she was dating her lead prosecutor when she hired him. And the accusation is that that was part of a motivation for hiring him. Is it enough that this just looks bad, that there's an appearance of a conflict? Or did they need to prove, did the defendants, that Trump and his co-defendants need to prove that there was an actual conflict? Now, again, I say that DA Fonnie Willis can stay on this case. It also appears that the judge is saying that this appearance issue needs to be addressed before this can go forward. The judge in this case this morning saying the defendants did actually not prove an alleged or did not prove an actual conflict of interest from all that financial entanglement. However, the judge is saying there is an appearance of conflict. The decision says the district attorney may choose to step aside along with the entirety of her office or she can let Nathan Wade go and the case can continue. So with the ball is now in Fonnie Willis's court to decide how to proceed. Donald Trump's team and his co-defendants say this is all a disqualifying conflict of interest. Uh, the case should be thrown out because of it. The DA stays on the case, hence her office stays on the case, hence it can continue to move forward. I'm somebody who wants to push common sense, not Washington, D.C. spin and, and newsroom spins, but we outside of D.C. watch and we can have a barometer for when someone is not giving us common sense. And it's just common sense that she should not be on the case and she should be disbarred. So Judge McAfee's uh, ruling basically is only one potential uh, liar. And that's what he calls him. He said the odor of mendacity can uh, prosecute a case. You can't have two. You can have one. But not two. And the one could be the district attorney who started all this, who, you know, you would think would be responsible. We're taking your phone calls at 1 800 684 3110. Let me talk to the folks that are watching on our social media feeds, whether it's X, Twitter, or Facebook, or YouTube, or Rumble. There are a lot of you watching right now, and some of you are probably new to this broadcast and new to the ACLJ. Let me encourage you to subscribe, hit like as well, and also share this feed with your friends. It makes a big difference. So we want you to do that whether it's Rumble, YouTube, or um, X or ATA. You may be watching on ACLJ.org on our website as well. Let's go right back to the phones. Let's go to Bob who's calling in on line one. Bob, go ahead. Uh, Thank you. Um, Since we know the proper signification of this word mendacity would be a disposition to lie or habitual lying, if Fonnie Willis decides to continue a case that has the odor of mendacity, could the judge please explain how the continuation with her would not multiply that? Let me say something, and I agree with you 100%, Bob. I'm going to let Harry comment on this, but I'm going to say something very direct here. This judge is way over his head, okay? He's been out of law school probably 8 or 10 years. This was just on the bench new, and you made a big mistake. And I know he's supposedly conservative, and I, I get all that. But you can't say the person's lying under oath and has an odor of mendacity in the case. And what she said at the church was legally improper and then say you could still prosecute the former president of the United States. Judge, what were you thinking? You're thinking about your election coming up, I'm afraid. That's the reality. Harry? Uh, Well, I think you're absolutely correct. So first, there is an odor of mendacity. Secondly, uh, what... Fonnie Willis said at the church was legally improper. But third, uh, you don't even have to go that far in order to disqualify. So the judge on page 13 quotes Federalist number 78. Thus, it is sometimes the case that an attorney guiltless in any actual sense nevertheless is required to stand aside for the sake of what? public confidence in the probity of the administration of justice. This is a clear-cut case uh, that applies to that particular rule. So the judge had several bases 
for disqualifying Fonnie Willis, but could not find any uh, sufficient basis to disqualify her and the fruit of the poisonous tree in this particular case. So instead, the judge says the case against the defendants can indeed proceed. All that Fonnie Willis has to do is to make a choice, either disqualify herself or disqualify Wade. The choice was actually up to the judge, not to Fonnie Willis. This is exactly right, Harry. This is exactly correct. Andy, your thoughts? Let me tell you this also. We've got people on the line. Hang on the line. We're opening up some phone lines, 1-800-684-3110. If you've got any questions you want to talk to us. Andy? Yeah, I mean, what, what Harry said, I've got to, I was nodding my head in agreement vigorously. The choice is the judges. The decision is the judges. The ruling is to be made by the judge. You've abrogated your responsibility as a superior court judge, and you have said, I'm not, I don't have the courage to rule on this thing the way I need to because I'm running for re-election in Fulton County and it's heavily Democratic and I'm a young, white Republican judge, so I'm scared. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, here, Fonny, you decide. You want to stay in the case? Fine, wonderful, stay in your whole office. 150 strong lawyers can prosecute the president and the former mayor of uh, New York and, and the former speaker of the House and, and or the uh, majority leader of the House and everybody else. We we'll only just get rid of your boyfriend, that's all, and that will remove the odor of mendacity. What about your own odor of mendacity? Does that leave too, Fawny? No, it stays with you. So basically, it stays with you throughout the case. So, the judge made a huge mistake here. Evelyn's calling from Texas on line six. Evelyn, go ahead. You're on the air. Hi, yes. Thank you for uh, what you guys do, and I watch you daily. Great. Um, but Andy stole my uh, comment just before the break right. in that. The odor of mendacity says that it stinks, um, but the judge is not willing to do anything to clear out the stink. It's just going to stay stinky. You're, well, exactly. I mean, and even Ellie Honing from CNN, this is uh, bite number 24. Take a listen. Any one of these statements by a judge would be a career ender for a normal prosecutor to have an on the record finding that there are reasonable questions about whether you lied under oath. Uh, that would be that would be devastating, and we'll see what the political effects will be. The bottom line: the DA survives, but not without serious bruising. Serious bruising is not enough here. She needed to be removed from the case for what she did. Period. Let's go to Sandra's calling from North Carolina. We're taking your calls at one eight hundred six eight four thirty one ten. Again, those of you watching on any of our social media feeds, please subscribe and share it with your friends. We've got literally. Thousands and thousands and thousands of you watching right now. We encourage you to do that. Hi, Sandra. Hello. Um, can't they appeal this? And can't Kemp, as the governor, that he sees there's corruption here, can he not fire her? Okay, so those are good questions. I'm going to let Andy answer them, who knows more of the Georgia law. Let's start with the appeal. It's a discretionary appeal. It's not It's not a mandatory grant. Right, because this is a ruling during the pendency of the case, and it's not a final ruling, Sandra. There is no absolute right to an appeal. The judge could say, I'll let you take an appeal, but then you'd go to the Court of Appeals, and even the Court of Appeals has discretion to hear the appeal or not. So the likelihood is, in my opinion, that the three-judge panel of the Georgia Court of Appeals, if it went to them, would probably not hear the case. Secondly, the governor cannot remove her because the, she has not been disqualified uh, by a superior court judge. The governor doesn't have... The governor in Georgia is the source from which all manna floweth, but not that much. So no, no to that. I mean, she will be the. Pro There's no doubt in my mind that she will stay on the case, and she's going to fire Wade, and basically Wade becomes the fall person on this. We're taking your calls at one eight hundred six eight four thirty one ten eight hundred six eight four three one one zero. I I do need to say this. This is why the fight for justice uh, is something you got to keep going, and and you got and you got to keep fighting, and that's whether it's in you know the U.S. Supreme Court where we fought for your right to vote for the candidate of your choice on ballots across the country. Started out in Colorado by the, you know, a month later, we were dealing with 15 cases. We won that 9-0. The second part of that case is at the Supreme Court right now. Order probably coming out this afternoon or tomorrow, or, or excuse me, Monday. That's why we're filing a brief in the immunity case, because presidents have to have a limited presidential immunity for official acts, or they cannot be able to make decisions. That's why we're defending whistleblowers. So all of this work that goes on, 
is to defend the Constitutional Republic that we want to leave to our children and to our grandchildren. And I, you think about that when you – this decision – the disappointing part to me in the decision was the judge making findings of fact of, of lying and impropriety and the appearance of impropriety and then does nothing. And says, well, Fani, you'd make the decision. You could stay in if you want and you get to try the case or you can get rid of Wade and you make the call. And then he said what she said was improper, legally improper, which, by the way, that's not even a legal standard, legally improper. You mean, you mean unlawful, a violation of the law? This is where this judge is young and inexperienced. But I could say that because I've been doing this for 44 years. But I, I, I will tell you, very poorly written decision, wrong conclusion. If he would have said, listen, I listened to the evidence and I didn't find that there was an appearance of impropriety and I don't think anybody was lying, that would be his call. He was the trier of fact. But he doesn't. He says, no, all these things were wrong. All these things were the the, the odor of mendacity surrounding the case. She made statements that were still legally improper, but I'm letting her stay in there. And warning her, be careful, you better not do it again. But this is exactly the reason why we fight. Now, we're taking your calls when we come back from the break at 1-800-684-3110. Our phone lines are jammed now. They'll open up a little during the breaks here. 1-800-684-3110. If you're watching on social media, share with your friends. As we've been mentioning for the last two weeks, we are now in the middle of our life and liberty drive here at the ACLJ. And as we continue to witness the left's weaponization of the justice system to attack their political rivals, the ACLJ continues to fight back. But we can only do that through your support and your help. Right now, we are preparing to defend the Constitution by filing a brief at the Supreme Court in the Trump immunity case. That is due Tuesday. We're fighting the two-tiered system of justice to defend the FBI whistleblowers. Our next brief on that one is due April 3rd. We're battling with now 19 cases against the Biden deep state, and that's because we're filing today a federal cause of action against the State Department over the issue of funds from the State Department being given to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Agency, with the knowledge that UNRWA was aiding and abetting Hamas. Please support these battles with us now during our Life and Liberty Drive. Any amount you donate is doubled at ACLJ.org. And if you're able, please become an ACLJ champion. We started this campaign for champions with about 15,000. Our goal is to get to almost 30,000 in the next 12 to 18 months. First goal coming up is 20,000. And I'm happy to say we are only 162 short of our goal. If you can be one of those 162 champions, we would really appreciate it. Those are champions who fight alongside us each and every month. If you can make a one-time gift only, that's absolutely fine, too. Go to ACLJ.org to have your gifts doubled now. Building a bridge, or a floating pier, I guess, is the actual title, in Gaza, which is going to require the Army Corps of Engineers, which is the Army, to have over 1,000 U.S. troops, and they initially said 2,000 U.S. troops, building this pier, this floating pier, and then the president says, but don't worry, we're not going to have any U.S. troops boots on the ground. But the boots on the ground are building the pier. I share your grave concern about the, the risk that our troops are going to be put under. You know, when the, the DOD spokesperson, a, a general in the Air Force, talked about this, his words e- reinforced that concern. When he said, and, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, if Hamas truly cares about the Palais- Palestinian people, one would hope that they would support and allow this effort to move forward. But the Houthis, maybe it's not Hamas, maybe it's the Houthis, because they seem to like the maritime, they like the admiralty, they like the water, they use the sea. Attack the United States troops, and, you know, troops are killed. What do we do as the United States? What do you do in the case of of absolute chaos and a mob of people who are hungry and and who we have compassion for and who are starving and trying to get food for their kids and family. What are you going to do when the proverbial stuff hits the fan and there's a serious security situation? You know, you you think of situations like Black Hawk Down, for example, in Somalia, and you can see how very quickly one unforeseen incident that should have planned for when, when things go wrong, anything's possible and then we could end up with a serious not only loss of life but but layered on another geopolitical disaster i just think this whole thing is so dangerous a powder keg it it is jay it is a powder keg for all the reasons that you stated and and they don't appear to have thought this whole thing through
Hey, welcome back to the broadcast. Everyone, we're taking your calls, 800-684-3110. Uh, Simon on YouTube wrote, does the fact that she says, stays on this, could that actually work better for the defendants as they can fall back on the words of the judge about her conduct? I think no, Andy. No, I don't think so at all. I don't think that the judge's comments in an order in a case can ever be used in the trial in chief. Right. I don't either. Mark is calling from California. He's online too. Hi, Mark. He's listening on YouTube. Jay, I appreciate the uh, the comments you guys make. They're always accurate and concise. I'm interested in what happens to the four cases that have already been pleaded out, like Sidney Powell and the other three defendants. Do those get relitigated, or what's your opinion on no, that? I think those pleas are good. Those pleas are valid. Uh, if she would have been thrown off the case and a new DA came in and said, hey, we're not going to proceed, then I think they could have gone in and gotten their pleas revoked because it was under a false pretense. But... That's not happened here, so that no, it doesn't affect any of that. Let's go over to um, Mike, who's calling from Washington. He's listening on Rumble. Mike, go ahead. You're on the air. Yeah, uh, what I'm about to say is probably ridiculous, but um, if this is how our justice system, our judicial system works today, I think they should call up Donald Trump and give him the option to decide how he wants things to, to be handled going forward because that's kind of what they're doing with Fannie Willis, isn't it? Well, I think worse in Fannie Willis's case, he's been found guilty of an impropriety, le- law, what he, the judge called legally improper, and the appearance of impropriety. And you're supposed to have the legal system, Harry, is supposed to be above reproach, especially the criminal justice system. That is not what you have here. I think you're precisely correct. So the Supreme Court, and the judge notes this, uh, that disqualification due to an appearance of impropriety should rarely occur where there is no danger that the actual trial or of the case will be tainted. Here the judge notes affirmative ed- evidence that the trial has already been tainted and there is a clear and present danger of future taint. Nonetheless, this particular judge lacks the courage, in my opinion, uh, to disqualify Fonnie Willis. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. Melissa's calling. She's calling from Connecticut. She's watching on ACLJ.org. Melissa, go ahead. You're on the air. Thanks, Jay, to, to you and your team for all you do. If Bonnie fires Wade, then what happens to all the money that he was paid? Same question. Um, he would say it was earned at the time. He gets it. He keeps it. $658,000 plus whatever expenses he got. He earned it. He billed the county. Fulton County paid for it. Bonnie Willis approved the payments. It's his money. End of story. I think that's right. This is a this decision. This judge is an absolute total fiasco, in my view. And I mean, I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. I mean, he's a young guy, and he's been practicing law about eight, eight or ten years. And I don't know how many cases he tried. And but this this decision that he thinks is like the wisdom of Solomon is ridiculous. They were legally improper. What was lawfully unlawful? What they did legally improper, but still it was legally improper. He says. There's a at least an appearance of impropriety, which is the judicial standard. But I'm going to give the person that lied, who created the odor of mendacity around the case, the decision on which way to go. You know, you figure that one out, folks. Alan's calling from Texas. He's watching on YouTube. Alan, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm calling to ask why nobody has addressed the fact of something called malicious prosecution against Trump. This guy gets arrested and charged and search warrants, arrest warrants, one after another, after another, after another. It's obvious what they're doing. What is that not against the law in this country anymore? Well, malicious prosecution would be, and they've made a series of motions, uh, motions to dismiss. Now, all of them have not been raised yet because the situation with Fawny Willis kind of came out of nowhere. So there's going to be a whole series of additional motions filed, Andy. Yes, there will be. Uh, I don't know that it's reached the level of malicious prosecution that is absolutely, utterly, totally baseless. I think the RICO uh, allegations and the RICO thing is ridiculous. And uh, the expert witness who they got, I don't think, is uh, really thinking right when he advises them that there's a racketeering case here. But because the judge has... Uh, ruled on certain motions and uh, dismissed them, and they're going to probably be reindicted. I think that there is some sort of an aura of legitimacy to the prosecution. That remains to be seen. Other motions are going to be filed. Nadine is calling from Georgia on line four. Nadine, go ahead. You're on the air. Hi, Jay. Thank you. Sure. I've been following you since Virginia when you were on CBN. Oh, uh, also, 
You're welcome. Thank you for what you guys do. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, this is reminiscent of Comey and HRC, and now her and Biden is just a continuation of um, how corrupt our system is. You know, we talked about it was a Comey-like decision. There was all these violations of the law, but never then the nevertheless comes. Nevertheless, we're not going to prosecute, which wasn't even Comey's decision to make, by the way. That's another story. But here you had the same thing, improper Still legally improper, appearance of impropriety, odor of mendacity surrounds the case, and yet the judge doesn't do the right thing, Harry. I think you're right. So here we have proof of corruption. We have proof of impropriety. We have a clear and unmistakable situation where there is the appearance uh, of impropriety, but at the end of the day, there are no real consequences with respect to the DA. You know, it's funny. It makes no sense. Uh, Ari, I'm watching some of the comments that come in, and, and one of them is from Fulton, a person in Fulton County saying, and our taxpayer dollars are paying for this, Andy? My taxpayer dollars are paying for it. That makes me even angrier. Yeah. I live in Fulton County. I'm uh, not happy. All right, Michael, very quickly, go ahead. You're on the air. Yeah, I was just saying that, that my angle is, is that there's. it seems like there's no honest judge in the United States of America at this point because you have even Eileen Cannon in Florida who quoted the her document and said there's no real case here but we're going to go forward anyway and with Fonnie willis there wasn't just the appearance of impropriety there was perjury and the, at least the appearance of perjury this this is crazy and on well, each here's, case, here's the thing you know i don't want to i don't i'm not going to besmirch judge cannon because she's still got two motions that are pending before her but i will tell you this some of these decisions from some of these courts have been i will agree outrageous and that's why we won at the Supreme Court 9-0 to zero against the decision out of the Colorado Supreme Court, which was nonsense. That's why I believe we'll win the immunity case if the president's – I know what we're arguing. We're arguing for a limited presidential immunity for official acts only. If they will limit it to that, I think they can win. If they go for this, the president could do anything at any time and order the assassination of a political opponent. And the answer to that has to be no. That's not an official act. So all of that takes place. That's why we're engaged in these cases. I know it's frustrating, folks, but that's why you got to have tenacity to stand through that, and that's why we are fighting back. As we've been mentioning for the last two weeks, we are now in the middle of our life and liberty drive here at the ACLJ. And as we continue to witness the left's weaponization of the justice system to attack their political rivals, the ACLJ continues to fight back. But we can only do that through your support and your help. Right now, we are preparing to defend the Constitution by filing a brief at the Supreme Court in the Trump immunity case. That is due Tuesday. We're fighting the two-tiered system of justice to defend the FBI whistleblowers. Our next brief on that one is due April 3rd. We're battling with now 19 cases against the Biden deep state, and that's because we're filing today a federal cause of action against the State Department over the issue of funds from the State Department being given to UNRWA, the United Nations Relief Agency, with the knowledge that UNRWA was aiding and abetting Hamas. Please support these battles with us now during our Life and Liberty Drive. Any amount you donate is doubled at ACLJ.org. And if you're able, please become an ACLJ champion. We started this campaign for champions with about 15,000. Our goal is to get to almost 30,000 in the next 12 to 18 months. First goal coming up is 20,000. And I'm happy to say we are only 162 short of our goal. If you can be one of those 162 champions, we would really appreciate it. Those are champions who fight alongside us each and every month. If you can make a one-time gift only, that's absolutely fine, too. Go to ACLJ.org to have your gifts doubled now.